Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Agroforestry in Action webinar series. My name is Gregory Ormsby Mori. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. This webinar series is a production of the Center for Agroforestry. Today, we have a, a special guest. Uh, our presentation today is uh, by Katie Commender. She is the Director of the Appalachian Sustainable Development Program. Uh, I'm sorry, a correction. She's the Agroforestry Program Director at the Appalachian Sustainable Development. Uh, the presentation today is titled Appalachian Harvest Herb Hub, Empowering Plant Conservation Through Profit Cultivation. In a minute, I'll give uh, some more uh, background on our speaker, but uh, just let me say that uh, this uh, series, uh, uh, again, produced by the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri, we hold these uh, webinars approximately monthly. And this presentation and, and all previous uh, presentations in this series are recorded. And you can find recordings of past webinar presentations on our website at centerforagroforestry.org uh, and under the uh, webinar tab and you'll find a schedule for future webinars and recordings of past webinars that are available for viewing on demand at any time. So thanks so much for joining us today. Again, our, our speaker today, Katie Commender, the Agroforestry Program Director at the Appalachian Sustainable Development Program. Uh, Katie uh, uh, runs that program. Uh, she has um, done quite a bit uh, over the years in, in training hundreds of, of new forest farmers in what's through what's called the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition, uh, chaining the next generation of forest farmers. She, uh, she got started in her agroforestry career back in 2012 as an agroforestry AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer at ASD, Appalachian Sustainable Development. In just a few years, she uh, made quite an impact as a volunteer. She trained hundreds of forest farmers, as I mentioned. She developed a multifunctional repair and buffer program with the US Fish and Wildlife Service that helped uh, farmers uh, with conservation production and production goals across Southwest Virginia. She was the lead on a Virginia NRCS conservation innovation grant project, and she's authored revisions for riparian forest buffer practice standards uh, that uh, in important uh, include planting and harvesting of useful fruit, uh, nut and flowering trees and shrubs as, as part of those uh, riparian forest buffers. Uh, so that's a great uh, approach to uh, something we like to, we, we call uh, the productive conservation approach. So it's a it's really important approach, especially with uh, some of the conservation uh, uh, programs. Uh, in 2016, Katie co-developed what's called the Non-Timber Forest Product Calculator with the National Agroforestry Center and co-edited co -edited the Temperate Agroforester newsletter. Uh, in the meantime, she uh, completed a master's degree in forestry with the Virginia Polytechnical Institute and State University, Virginia Tech, and served as a graduate teaching assistant there. So she had a lot of uh, activity in agroforestry and made quite an impact. In fact, we were very fortunate to have her as our keynote speaker at the recent North American Agroforestry Conference last uh, summer in Oregon. And we were very pleased to have her as our uh, uh, keynote, as I mentioned. Uh, so in 2017, uh, Katie founded uh, the Appalachian Harvest Herb Hub uh, to help medicinal herb farmers sustainably grow, process, and market herbs to premium domestic and international markets. Uh, that's what we're going to hear more about today. Katie believes that by helping farmers sustainably produce medicinal herbs in both forest farming and alley cropping systems, conservation through profitable cultivation can be achieved. So we're going to turn things over to Katie in just a minute. I should mention that after Katie's presentation, we do have time for some Q&A, so stick around. So uh, with that, thank you uh, for joining us. And Katie, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Gregory, for the introduction. Um, as Gregory mentioned, I'm the Agroforestry Program Director with Appalachian Sustainable Development. Um, and it's hard to believe, but we're turning 25 this year. And it's a little bit chaotic around the office today in Abingdon, Virginia. Uh, we are moving uh, to a new location. So this actually gives me a really good excuse to rest my back for a minute and, uh, not, and not continue to move heavy desks around. Um, so thanks for, for joining in this Agroforestry in Action webinar. Um, as Gregory mentioned, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about our Appalachian Harvest Herb Hub, um, which was founded at ASD uh, in Duffield, Virginia in 2017, um, and the work that we're doing with building up a network of forest farmers in central Appalachia. And ultimately, the goal of all of this work is to empower people to conserve at-risk forest botanicals like ginseng and golden seal, 
Um, and we think one potential way to do that is through profitable cultivation in a forest farming system. Uh, so I'm gonna share a little bit of information about that. Um, let's see, how do we click to the next? There we go. Um, so to start, I'm gonna sort of take a step back, um, the, the 10,000, a foot view to really talk about some of the opportunities and challenges that we see with forest farming in central Appalachia to set the stage. Um, and then talk about one potential solution uh, that we've been exploring here in Southwest Virginia called the Appalachian Harvest Herb Hub and what the implications are for forest farmers in our regions. And then as Gregory said, we'll open it up uh, for Q&A and some discussion. So I look forward to your questions. Appalachian Sustainable Development, or ASD, um, as I said, we're turning 25 this year, and uh, we were really founded in 95 to help organic, or help tobacco farmers transition into organic fruit and vegetable production. Um, and so in doing so, helping to transition Appalachia to a more resilient and healthier economy and population, um, and we work largely um, with agriculture. Um, so those are the new types of economic opportunities we're looking for. Uh, and as you can imagine, in central Appalachia, a vast majority of our landscape is forested. So we don't just focus on uh, field-grown herbs uh, and field-grown fruits and vegetables, but we're also looking at our woods um, and what sort of opportunities lie there um, for both you know, healthy food and traditional medicine, uh, but also economic opportunities for our community. And, and so a big part of the program that I run, the our agroforestry program, focuses on what's called forest farming. Um, and I just copied over just a, a quick definition so that we all are on the same page of, of what I'm talking about when I say forest farming. Um, and essentially, if you think about the forest landscape, we're cultivating high value specialty crops under the forest canopy. Um, so a lot of times we go out in the woods, we're looking up at our trees, but in my, uh, case, um, working with forest farmers, we're looking in the understory. Um, and that can be uh, medicinal species like golden seal that you see on the left. Um, it can be edible species like sataki mushrooms that you see growing on logs on the right. Um, and it could also be ornamental species uh, like grapevines, for example, that are used to make wreaths. Um, but in a forest farming system, you know, we're not just throwing out seeds into the woods and, and then leaving it there. We're intentionally modifying and maintaining the forest canopy to provide optimum shade levels that are gonna favor growth and production of the, um, whether it's you know, forest botanicals or shiitakes that we're growing in the understory. Um, so our work at the Herb Hub, as you can imagine, is largely focused on medicinal species. So forest botanicals like golden seal, like ginseng, that can be grown in the forest understory. Um, and forest botanicals, essentially, they're just perennial woodland herbs uh, that, in this case, we're focusing on the ones that are native to Appalachia. Um, so I'll go over a few of those um, just to give you an idea of the types of species that we're working with. American ginseng uh, is probably one of the most um, notable ones in, in history. We think about um, when our country was founded. Um, in the 1700s, we have uh, exports of ginseng alongside the fur trade um, being exported to China uh, and, and starting international markets in our country for the first time. Um, and so uh, ginseng essentially uh, is used as an adaptogenic type of herb. Um, it's said to improve mental activity, fertility, uh, stress toler tolerance, um, energy, uh, and so it's a really, really commonly harvested herb um, in Appalachia, and it has a really deep-rooted history and cultural connection um, to our woods and our communities. Um, when we think about uh, site selection, one of the, the key differences, a lot of these herbs are, are found on north or northeast-facing slopes um, with roughly 70% shade. Uh, and so ginseng, I would say one of the differences is calcium. Um, this particular species requires about 2,000 pounds of calcium per acre. Um, and in terms of disease for a lot of these species, um, proper site selection uh, can help mitigate disease, like blight, for example, um, if there's enough spacing between plants and there's good airflow, and root rot, for example, if it's, um, uh, these plants are grown on a bit of a slope uh, and not in areas where there's gonna be pooling 
water. So we need good air drainage and good water drainage for these plants to really thrive. For propagation for ginseng, um, oftentimes uh, folks will use stratified ginseng seed. Um, and we're looking at anywhere from five to seven years for a harvest of a mature root that you see in the bottom right hand corner, um, at least uh, from, from stratified seed. Also, um, you see the bright red berries uh, that are, will be forming uh, in September and the fall. Uh, and so those can also be harvested and, and put right back in the ground as well. Golden seal is another common uh, forest botanical that we work with here in Appalachia. Uh, hydrastine and berberine are the two medicinal constituents, the compounds that are found uh, in this particular plant. And if you look on the bottom right hand corner, it's what gives it the really, really bright yellow and beautiful uh, rhizome. And so berberine and hydrastine also help um, uh, traditionally with congestion, eye and ear infections, mouth sores, um, even uh, with digestion. So it's an herb for me personally that I'm using in tincture form uh, when I get the first signs of a cold coming on to really uh, pick it before it starts. Um, with this one, in terms of pests, uh, you know, slugs are, are something uh, that could definitely be an issue. Um, root knot nematodes uh, are also a potential problem for golden seal. And then in terms of diseases, uh, you know, just the, the blight and the root rot, but again, proper site selection can help mitigate that. For propagation, um, one of my favorite ways to propagate golden seal, and I think will have the highest uh, germination rate, um, is not so much with seed, uh, but with rhizome division. So if you look at that root on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, you see these beautiful growing buds um, that are popping up. And so you can cut that plant that rhizome in half um, and, and get multiple cuttings out of that, um, multiple rhizome divisions that you can then replant um, to propagate more than one plant out of that one rhizome. For black cohosh, this is another uh, common forest botanical that we see in our, our woodlands here. Um, it is a traditionally used as a women's herb um, for help with supporting birthing. Um, hormones, menopause, but also if you see the beautiful white flower on the bottom side of the screen, it's also used commonly as a landscape plant. It's one that I have growing around my house in some of the uh, shadier areas. For site selection, um, I mentioned that a lot of these forest botanicals do require quite a bit of shade. However, um, some species like black cohosh and Solomon seal, for example, um, can handle a little bit more sun and they are oftentimes more reproductive um, and more uh, just will grow bigger and better um, in those sorts of areas. One of the biggest things to think about with black cohosh, um, you may go out in your woodlands and, and see the leaves that you see in this um, upper picture, uh, but if you're not seeing this plant when it's in flower or when it's in seed production, you may accidentally um, misidentify it. And so you really need strong identification skills for this particular species because it has a lot of lookalikes in Appalachia. Um, if you look at the seed pods in that middle bottom picture, uh, there's, a, there's an orange circle around one of the seed heads. And so typically there's one stem coming off with one seed pod um, per stem. And that's how you can identify black cohosh. With propagation, again, one of my favorite ways uh, to propagate black cohosh is with that rhizome division. So you can see lots of great growing buds on uh, the rhizome in the bottom right-hand screen. So adulteration in the industry, as I mentioned, uh, black cohosh does have a lot of lookalikes. And so with American bugbane, for example, if you look at the leaves for bugbane, and we go back and look at the leaves for black cohosh, they're very, very similar. Uh, the difference is one stem comes out and you see the orange circle on the upper left-hand screen and there's multiple seed pods per stem. Uh, and so that's one of the easiest ways to tell the difference. Doll's eye is another look-alike with the leaves, but if you look at the creepy doll's eye uh, seed head there in the orange circle, it's very easy to tell the difference uh, if, if you look at it um, when in production. 
Now, the opportunities uh, for forest farming, I think, in Appalachia are pretty significant. In Virginia alone, where ASD is located, uh, we have over 62% of our land is forested. Um, and so lots of great potential, uh, lots of, we're also in a biodiversity hotspot in central Appalachia, um, where there's lots of good habitat for growing these plants and they're already growing and actually being harvested natively uh, in the wild. So if you look at the map on the right hand side, this is a, a root report uh, map that was generated from Virginia Tech's uh, study where they interviewed or they, where they surveyed ginseng dealers uh, throughout central Appalachia to get a sense of what they're buying and in what volume. And so this map in particular is looking at a forest botanical called bloodroot uh, and the darkest colors show the highest density of harvest. And so right where we are in central Appalachia and southwest Virginia, eastern Kentucky and um, southern West Virginia are already really big hot spots for wild, wild harvesting of these botanicals, which is where the majority of the supply uh, is coming from in this industry. You put that on top of you know, high levels of interest and the cultural connections that I mentioned with plants like ginseng, for example, that have been harvested in these hills for generations. Um, and as I mentioned, our biodiversity here, we have ideal growing conditions. I think there's great opportunity uh, for forest farming these botanicals. Now, on the flip side, there are several challenges uh, that we need to address first. First of all, as I mentioned uh, with ginseng stratified seed, five to seven years to uh, just to be able to harvest, right? Um, and so these plants are slow growing. This is not a tomato, this is not a pepper. You're not gonna plant it and harvest it in that same year. These are slow growing perennials. Um, in addition, oftentimes the roots that you're harvesting from these plants are very, very small. Um, if you think back to the picture of uh, the yellow golden seal rhizome that I showed, um, it can take, depending on how big and how mature the plants are, um, you know, up to 400 roots to make one dry pound and, you know, seven years from seed. Um, so if we take a look at that and we know that these plants have been harvested um, for centuries in this country, um, what we see over time uh, from over harvesting in the wild and from habitat loss uh, are population declines. So a lot of these plants are being harvested from the wild and it's getting harder and harder to find them. You're having to walk farther and farther to see them uh, and they're slowly starting to disappear. Um, so that's a challenge, but I also think it, it presents an opportunity where forest farming can provide um, an option for conserving these plants in a cultivated setting. And then if you look again, this is from the root report from Virginia Tech on the right hand side at the prices for a lot of these forest botanicals that are being harvested in the wild. Uh, black cohosh, for example, 85 cents fresh rate and $3.50 per dry pound. Um, and black cohosh is about, um, about 20 to 25 roots per dry pound. Uh, and again, seven years from seed. And so the prices for a lot of these botanicals are under $4 per dry pound. Um, and so based on that wild harvested model, it, it is not economically feasible for someone to spend the extra time farming these botanicals unless we can bring price points up uh, for sustainably verified botanicals. Also, when you actually sit down and calculate your labor costs and your cost of production, um, obviously these prices are not going to cut it. Uh, and so it can be pretty labor intensive to process a lot of these roots um, and to get it to meet buyer specifications. And then lastly, a lot of buyers um, in the industry are going to have pretty large volume minimums. And so, you know, a buyer may need 100 pounds, maybe they need 2000 pounds of golden seal, for example. Um, and that can be really difficult for one supplier to meet that on their own. So it requires um, a network of forest farmers to work together cooperatively. So just to put some of these numbers into perspective, um, this is some data from APA and US Fish and Wildlife Service. If we look at the top um, example, black cohosh of known trade volumes, uh, and this is from 97 to 2005, um, anywhere from 118,000 to 760,000 dry pounds per year are harvested 
uh, largely in the wild for black cohosh. It, now, that volume may not seem like a lot, but remember I said it's you know up to 25 roots per dry pound. Now, if we take that on the high end of 760,000 dry pounds per year, that's 19 million plants a year that are harvested largely from the wild. Um, and so that sort of helps paint the picture of what's going on in our woods um, and, and what we need to really start addressing before it's too late. So in 2017, um, we were taking a look at some of these opportunities and challenges and trying to figure out one potential solution that ASD with our expertise could uh, provide in Southwest Virginia. And in 2000, uh, we created the Appalachian Harvest Food Hub. Um, and that's a, a facility that we have here in Duffield, Virginia in Scott County um, that's really designed to help organic and conventional fruit and vegetable farmers access wholesale markets. So wholesale distribution centers all the way from Maryland down to Georgia. Um, so we have uh, shared use washing equipment for vegetable produce farmers, um, cooler space, and uh, big tractor trailers that we use to distribute that produce um, into grocery stores. So we had extra space in this facility that you see here. And so what we decided to do is expand our food hub to also include an herb hub within the same facility. Uh, and that was done in 2017. And really the vision behind this was to help create a sustainable herbal economy in central Appalachia. Um, and as I mentioned when I started the presentation, the ultimate goal here is to conserve these at-risk forest botanicals through profitable cultivation in a forest farming system. Um, and so our herb hub uh, offers the following services to help address some of the challenges um, that I just mentioned. First, we start with training. Um, anything from workshops on oops, uh, propagation, seed to sale training. So all the way from propagation to post-harvest handling and, and drying herbs um, and even connections with markets. Uh, and largely, this is done with a group called the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition. Um, it's, it's currently housed and led by Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, and it's a network of all nonprofits and government agencies and universities that are all bringing expertise together um, on forest farming to provide trainings to uh, a growing network of forest farmers. And I think to date, there's over 1,000 members uh, in ABFFC uh, and growing. And so we've actually recently added in some new partners, U Mountain Center in West Virginia and Organic Grower School in uh, North Carolina. Um, and these partners are, are really dispersed throughout Central Appalachia. So for example, Rural Action United Plant Savers are up in Ohio, Penn State obviously is up in Pennsylvania. We have partners down in West Virginia, North Carolina, and then ASD covers uh, both Southwest Virginia and Northeast Tennessee as well. So uh, the ABFFC, that's their, their website. Um, it's free to become a member um, and it gives access. We have uh, a Facebook where you can connect with other forest farmers. We share information about upcoming events there. Um, and then if you become a member, you also have access to a slew of resources that I kind of think of as a one-stop shop library. So instead of spending hours online looking for um, extension publications and resources on all these various forest botanicals, um, a lot of that information is right there. Uh, and then we also have spent quite a bit of time uh, developing this forest farming, uh, or I should say Virginia Tech has spent quite a bit of time developing this forest farming um, YouTube channel. So that almost 12,000 subscribers um, and all sorts of videos on here. Anywhere, anything from sustainable harvest of golden seal and washing and drying recommendations um, to tincture making uh, and all sorts of things. So really great resource to check out as well. And so our, our trainings with ABFFC, as I mentioned, anything from plant propagation. So here you see us um, working on, with uh, forest farmers on rhizome division, voucher specimens, essentially a, a plant press that some buyers require um, for proper identification of the herbs that you're gonna be harvesting and selling to them. 
And then also buyer connections. So in 2018, for example, we had a big expo where forest farmers could come and bring their products and um, buyers from all over the United States came and got to meet with them. We also put them on the spot and got them up on a panel presentation uh, so that they could share with forest farmers exactly what buyers need um, from forest farmers. Everything from communication to specifications of the herbs, what they're looking for, price points, that kind of stuff. And then ASD, um, as well as Rural Action up in Ohio, offer uh, what we call site visits. Um, so it's essentially on-farm technical assistance where we go out to a forest farmer's property um, and basically look at their forest stand um, and any existing populations of forest botanicals that, may, that they may have and uh, offer a site visit report at the end. Um, so similar to like a forest stewardship plan, for example, um, but really assessing what's there, what might be a good site, for forest farming specific botanicals based on their needs. Um, and then we can also help with plant population assessments to determine what existing supply of forest botanicals is already there that could be sustainably wild stewarded and tended to. And then next, um, one challenge that we identified is the need for cost share because planting stock and certifications can be pretty expensive. Um, so one certification program, it's a new one that we're working pretty closely with, uh, is called Forest Grown Verification. It was uh, started by Pennsylvania Certified Organic, or PCO, and it, last year it was handed over to United Plant Savers. Um, and it's a voluntary third-party verification program where an inspector is actually coming out to your forest, and they're assessing your populations and your sustainable management plan to ensure that your forest botanicals are both produced and harvested in a sustainable and legal manner. Um, and what we see with this program, uh, with buyers like Mountain Rose Herbs and others who have adopted it, is that this transparency yields more premium prices because consumers are increasingly concerned about the state of our forests and the state of the supply chain for forest botanicals, and they're willing to pay higher price points for sustainability. So what ASD is able to do as a nonprofit um, is secure grant funding to offer a cost share program. Um, so this page sort of outlines what the initial costs might be um, for both organic and forest grown verification uh, for a farmer to obtain. And then ASD is able to offer a $350 cost share. So rather than costing $1,200, for example, after ASD's cost share, um, and then there's 75% cost share from the Farm Service Agency, it costs farmers about $300 for certification in the end. We also are working on a cost share for planting stock. So right now we have a grant to work with um, nurseries like Granny's Ginseng, as Chester Crane, uh, to help build up supply of forest botanical planting stock so that as more forest farmers come on board, um, they know where to go and they have planting stock available. And we're also um, buying in bulk planting stock and then offering a 50% cost share uh, to um, forest farmers as well to help sort of reduce that initial barrier to entry to forest farming. We're also working on the processing side of things. So we had a farmer uh, in 2016 who after working with them, uh, they decided that they were gonna harvest black cohosh um, for this new forest grown verified market now that the price points were up. Um, and they bought a tiny little Cabela's dehydrator um, and they had their toothbrushes and they were out in October with freezing hands, scrubbing roots and cutting with hand pruners and sticking them in very small batches into the dehydrator um, and had to go back out in the woods and then inside again multiple, multiple times. Um, they worked with uh, Penn State University, Eric Burkhart, to do a break-even analysis to really look at what their labor costs. What is the cost of production to forest farm and produce dried black cohosh for a market? And what they realized is that their labor costs were $78 per dry pound, which if you think back to the wild harvested price of $3.50 per dry pound for black cohosh, they definitely did not make any money that year. Um, and so what they identified as a, an absolute need is shared use commercial herb processing equipment. Um, and so that's a priority that we made at our facility in Duffield. So I started out designing my first 
very own table, a root washing table with mesh screen. Um, and here I am down at the bottom right hand corner. I was very happy because it actually stood up on its own. It's the first table I ever built. Um, and so that's sort of the first step where farmers will or bring in their roots, dump it out on the table and give it an initial pre-wash uh, and cut. And we also have some uh, Hobart uh, food slicers uh, now that we can use to automate the process. And then um, we bought these Cushlin cement mixers. Um, and we ended up getting two of them because we liked them so much, but we just stick the roots in there, add some water, uh, press the button, and it washes it around, um, and it gets all the dirt off. We ended up buying, um, instead of a tiny commercial, or instead of a tiny uh, Cabela's dehydrator, we got a, uh, two commercial dehydrators. The one on the left is an Excalibur de dehydrator, and it has two different uh, zones. Um, so that two farmers could be operating the machine at the same time, even at different temperatures. So there's Teresa modeling some black cohosh drying. Uh, surprisingly, that little dryer cost us $14,000 with grant funding. Um, so it's, it can be very expensive for, for startup on your own, which is why we really wanted to offer shared use equipment uh, for farmers to come in and, and process their own uh, herbal material at our facility. And then, in 2018, uh, Gaia Herbs uh, was actually purchasing a new uh, walk-in dryer. This one's 40 foot by 10 foot. And so they donated their old one to us. And so we now have much, much bigger uh, drying space. The problem that we ran into is that sometimes, you know, most of the time farmers that we're working with right now are not bringing in enough roots to fire up a 40 foot by 10 foot herb dryer yet. And so we needed something that, that was of a size in between our commercial Excalibur dryer and our big um, old tobacco dryer. But we didn't have any grant funding left. So we built a budget dryer, which was like $100. Um, we went to Lowe's and we got some wood and we got a, a sheet of plastic. Um, and you see our fabulous door hinges that's made out of duct tape. Uh, and this was very affordable and we stuck in uh, some stainless steel uh, carts there on uh, casters so we can easily wheel it in and out. We got uh, some fans, a heater, dehumidifier, and it works just as well as our $14,000 Excalibur dryer. Um, so this is something that could easily be replicated at home. We also uh, had some uh, buyers who were interested in uh, working with aerial portions or the above ground portions like leaves and stems and flowers, um, but they needed it in smaller pieces than what you see there on the right. Um, and so there's a farm in uh, North Carolina who was using uh, an eco shredder. Essentially, it's a wood chipper, um, but you can uh, stick leaves and flowers in there and it'll chop it up for you to automate the process so you don't have to uh, stand there and hand garble everything on a screen. And lastly, we offer, um, we, we buy packaging and labeling materials in bulk uh, and then offer that to farmers at a discounted rate. Um, so you see Ryan here packaging some of his dried uh, black cohosh in the polywoven bags that we use. Um, and the labeling, uh, buyers are really going to want to know, you know, what is in the bag, obviously, what's the net weight, any certification, the origin, and also the biggest thing is lot number. Um, and so that's for traceability. So for example, that lot number shows who the farmer is, Ryan. It shows the Julian calendar date of harvest, 275. Um, it shows the year of harvest. So these roots were harvested in 2017. And then it also tells the story of, there's a crop code assigned to each of the botanicals we work with, so zero one, uh, is black cohosh, and it identifies exactly what field in Ryan's forest um, these herbs came from. So this way we can trace it back to exactly uh, where these herbs were produced and harvested. So the last service that we offer at the Herb Hub uh, is aggregation and marketing. And this is really designed to help connect forest farmers to premium price markets that truly value uh, sustainability. And, and like I said, we're doing that through a new program called Forest Grown Verified. Uh, and, and we're doing it through uh, advanced purchase orders. And so I work directly with companies in the United States and internationally now to secure 
advanced purchase orders so that farmers know exactly what they're harvesting is going to a secured market. Um, and also contract farming agreements. Uh, and so we have some buyers who are interested in investing in planting stock for farmers to help reduce that barrier um, in exchange for a guaranteed market at a guaranteed price um, and, and exclusivity of supply. So we're working out some arrangements like that too. Um, and what, another thing that we're doing aside from just certification, we're trying to look at other alternatives to root harvest, which essentially kills the plant, that would be more sustainable. Um, so on the top of these pictures, you see ginseng leaf. Um, so we're actually, research has found that there's similar ginsenoside medicinal compounds in the leaf as, as well as the root. And so you can get the same medicinal benefits from the leaf as you can the root. And so we're starting to work with forest farmers to harvest and dry leaves and sell those um, into markets as well. And what we're seeing um, is a shift in the marketplace. So for organic and forest grown verified, these sustainably forest farm botanicals, um, instead of, for example, black cohosh receiving $3.50 per dry pound, we're now getting around $45 per dry pound. Um, and, and those numbers are really based on uh, cost of production that our farmers have been keeping a good track of. Um, so I can't stress that enough. That's really important to do uh, with anything that you're growing. You need to know what your cost of production is um, in order to negotiate what price you need to actually grow it. Um, and, and we're able to see that with these certifications. And then also to address the issue, I mentioned a lot of buyers do require high volume minimums. So let's say a company is looking for 100 pounds of ginseng. That's a lot of roots. Um, and so at Appalachian Harvest, when farmers are bringing in uh, their roots and processing their own material, uh, we can then aggregate from multiple farmers to meet the volume minimums of say 100 pounds. Um, and then we'll ship that out directly to um, various buyers throughout the US and also in Canada. So what does that mean? Um, we came up with this potential solution. What's the so what and, and what impacts does it have? Um, and so remember I, I mentioned we were working with a farmer in Grayson County back in 2016. Uh, she was processing her black cohosh at home uh, and she, her break even price was $78 per dry pound. She was able with Forest Grown Verified um, testing the market to bring the price point up to $25, but she was still losing money. So uh, fast forward to 2017. Uh, we created the Herb Hub based on some community needs and recommendations that we received from farmers. We were able to negotiate the price up to $60 per dry pound to sort of meet in the middle and also to test the market to see if consumers were willing to pay that much. And with our equipment, even though this farmer was driving three hours from her home in Grayson County to where our facility is in Scott County, she brought her break-even price down to $44 per dry pound. Uh, and the first time ever, Michelle was able to make a profit for his farm. Um, and that's really what the Herb Hub is designed to do, to provide economic opportunities for forest farmers, um, while also encouraging the conservation of these botanicals like black cohosh that you see uh, Michelle with on the right. Now, when we think to, to future expansion of our Herb Hub um, and opportunities for farmers in our region, uh, one of the things that we're working on right now is uh, field grown herbs in an alley cropping system. Uh, so we're lucky enough to work with a company called Lush Cosmetics based in uh, Canada. And they uh, were generous enough to invest um, money into the two farmers that you see here, Reeves Valley Farm on the top and Mountain Rose Vineyards on the bottom uh, to grow field grown herbs in an alley cropping system to meet their demands for their product lines. Um, so they are under contract for a guaranteed market and a guaranteed price um, and Lush invested the startup funds needed um, to get off the ground and running. And so these farmers are growing um, on the bottom, for example, Mountain Rose Vineyards is growing uh, rows of elderberries uh, on an abandoned mine land uh, and uh, in Wise County, Virginia and uh, peppermint and nettles uh, in the alleyways. And we were just um, awarded uh, some additional funding that will be uh, able to expand this alley cropping project to even more farmers in central Appalachia. So we're excited to get started with that this year. 
And lastly, I just sort of want to end on a futuristic note. Um, the, the blue star that you see on this map from the root report, that's the herb hub. Uh, and when you see the, these red colors distributed throughout central Appalachia, obviously it's going to be really challenging for just our facility to work with all forest farming communities throughout central Appalachia. So one of the things that we're really working on this year uh, is trying to hone in on all the kinks and um, financial viability of our facility to eventually offer it as a replicable model uh, for other communities um, and, and maybe for even ginseng dealers, for example, um, to start uh, engaging in some of the markets that we're trying to develop. So just upcoming events, if anyone is local, uh, in Marlington, West Virginia, May 15th through 17th, um, the West Virginia Forest Farming uh, Initiative, which is a, a sub-branch uh, of the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition, uh, will be having a forest farming conference uh, in Marlington, West Virginia. And so you can check out their website. Uh, just stay tuned right now to save the date. Um, we'll be having a, a pretty exciting uh, multi-day event uh, focused on forest farming. And that's my contact information. And I guess with that, we could open it up uh, for questions with the time that we have remaining. And if we don't have time to cover them all, I encourage you to uh, note my uh, email and my phone number there and, and reach out to me if you have any questions afterwards. Well, thank you, Katie. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. <clears throat> As Katie mentioned, we do have some time for some questions uh, if you have any Thing you'd like to ask or any any observations or comments now it's best for us to use the uh, chat box and if you can see the chat box on your screen you just uh, type in a message or a question uh while uh some questions are coming in katie maybe i'll uh uh ask a few things uh one thing i'd like to ask and it goes to your one of your last comments there is you know advice or and this perhaps is a bit general but advice you may have or or what we can learn from your experience with the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition for other areas of the country, and I would I would say specifically in the Ozark region, we have of, of Missouri and, and Northwest Arkansas, we have uh, numerous uh, forest farmers that we're uh, networking with and trying to build a learning network. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't have anything near the kind of uh, cohesion and, and infrastructure that you've and, and impact you've been able to achieve in, in Appalachia. So I guess generally we'd you know, be looking for any kind of advice uh, and to try to learn from that experience. I, uh, while you think about that, I, I should uh, also think uh, ask, uh, Sarah Holtine Massingill, I think you are, if you're joining us, she's with our MU Extension uh, and, and focuses on these issues. But if you are with us, just, just shoot a, a comment and then uh, maybe we'll have you, if you wanted to make any questions. Um, well, uh, that, that would be a general question for me, Katie. Sure. Um, honestly, I think just the, the structure that the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition, ABFFC, has been able to provide, um, it, it's kind of like a big, it's become this big family, right? So we have experts from all over the region that are coming together towards a common cause, um, forest farming education and, and sort of building up this, this movement. And so with that collaboration and collective impact we've been able to have is, is far greater than anything that ASD, you know, our, our agroforestry program was started in uh, 2010. And I'd say when ABFFC was created, that really helped jumpstart and enable us to do way more than we would have been able to do alone. So I think where I would start is to sort of, you know, take a, take a seat back and take a look at who else is in your region that is doing similar things and have conversations with them and try to bring them together um, for a common goal. I think that's something that, that we've been able to do here in this region and Virginia Tech has been able to facilitate. And I would say even me professionally, I have really developed my knowledge and my skill sets by learning from these other experts. Um, and so it's, it's really, I think, important and critical to collaborate and, and work with other people outside of a silo. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's good advice. And, and what were, uh, some of the folks here in the center for agroforestry, some of our allies in, in, in extension and the different kinds of forest farmers and herb farmers that we've been able to engage with as we try to, uh, find the right pathway and, and build a learning network uh, between all of us. Mm -hmm. Um, 
while some of those uh, <clears throat> questions are okay. coming in, Katie, mm -hmm. see, there is a similar question about uh, uh, that came in from I West. Is there anything similar in the Midwest? And uh, I will read out. I'll, I'll reach out to that uh, participant and, and try to put her in touch with with us and, and the folks we're working with to, again, pursue a similar type of, of effort in, in building a, a learning network around forest farming in the Ozark mm -hmm. region. I haven't seen any other <clears throat> questions come in yet. Katie, did you recall some of the questions that came in uh, uh, before uh, <clears throat> in, in the registration? I, I might just uh, shoot one or two at you. One of the uh, participants was just asking about what you would see as, and, and maybe you're not able to fully uh, comment on this, uh, but what would you see as some of the best buyers of herbs and which herbs have the greatest monetary return on the market? Some of that you did touch on in, in your presentation. Mm -hmm. We we are pretty much exclusively working with wholesale herbal products manufacturers, um, and so that's that's sort of the niche, and that's where we're focusing on with forest farmers. But I think that there's a lot of great local markets that that you could tap into, um, like farmers markets, local apothecaries, um, even smaller. Uh, networks of herbalists in your community, I think, are also really great markets. Um, but that's sort of a, more of a direct-to-consumer approach that forest farmers would take um, directly with their consumers. Um, in terms of the the species, I think the ones that I mentioned, um, we're we're working a lot with uh, ginseng, golden seal. Um, I would say ginseng leaf and ginseng root. Uh, golden seal root to a lesser extent the leaf. Uh, the, the market price is not quite there yet for the leaf. Um, black cohosh root. Uh, and then we also work to a smaller degree with blue cohosh root and Solomon seal. Um, blood root, for example, wild yam, those are species that we've had demand for. The challenge is that the price points just aren't there yet um, for those particular herbs. And we think about a very small root like blood root. It takes quite a lot of herbs or quite a lot of roots to get a dry pound. Mm. Um, and so the price point really is, should be similar to golden seal, for example, um, based on that cost of production, but it isn't there yet. Um, and so that's just, we've, we've had to sort of take a look at what farmers have, what they're interested in, have experience growing, but then also what will the market bear and, and sort of narrow down the list of forest botanicals that we would recommend for farmers in that region. Yeah. Uh, there was a, thank you, uh, Katie. There was one participant, uh, who had sent in just seeking advice for her region contacts and uh, resources in her regions in, in Piney Flats, Tennessee, and perhaps we'll uh, make sure that you have uh, their contact information, and perhaps if you had any advice for Sandra Honeycutt in, in Piney Flats, Tennessee, where they could get started with uh, resources helping them for their forest farming interests. Um, but let's see uh, I, uh, if there's uh, any more questions that have come in uh, there's uh, one here. I've, I've gone back to the slide with the, the price comparisons. That was one question. And then I recall um, in the questions that came in with registration, there's another one here about mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, we currently are our food hub. Um, it helps uh, shiitake mushroom farmers access some wholesale markets. Um, a lot of the buyers that we're working with also would like dried mushrooms. Um, as well. And so that's just not something that we've gotten into yet. Uh, but we have in the past conducted workshops on shiitake logs, um, inoculation workshops, for example. And I think that that's sort of another uh, looking to the future, an area where um, we'd like to focus efforts on our uh, Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition um, has another round of funding for trainings over the next three years. And, and a big part of that is to expand ABFFC beyond just medicinal uh, non-timber forest products and, and more expansion to edibles. So things like ramps, for example, um, and mushrooms would all be included in that. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Um, <clears throat> did you, uh, I noticed you pulled up the, uh, the slide with the 2016, 2017 prices. Uh, did you wanna say anything more about the Michael's question about that pricing and cost comparison? Um, I guess, let's see. I don't know if, Michael, do you have any specific additional questions on this slide that you wanted clarification on? 
Hmm. In the meantime, we'll wait for Michael and see if he has any specific, more specific question about that. Uh, in response to uh, L, I'm sorry, I don't know the name, but L. Ipad's question about similar programs in the Pacific Northwest, I'm not specifically where you may be, uh, Katie, because you engage with uh, Mountain Rose and, and uh, others, uh, buyers there in, in, in Pacific Northwest, but we do have uh, Bodega Bashaw uh, on the, the, the webinar today, who is uh, works with agroforestry at, at Oregon State and is involved with agroforestry, so might be a resource. Uh, <clears throat> Bodega, if you have anything uh, to say on that score, do uh, do chime in, and and we'll we'll be sure to put um, the person asking that question in touch with you, Bodega. Uh, so uh, I would also, uh, while there's any more comments coming in, I'll uh, just uh, say to Ingrid West, who makes a question about the Midwest and mushroom growers, I think we could follow up you with you from the Center for Agroforestry at University of Missouri. And we have, again, uh, uh, been uh, engaging with folks around the region to build a learning network around forest farming, but also have a longstanding mushroom cultivation program. And we regularly make workshops and presentations about mushroom growing and, and resources that we can provide for you. So we will follow up with you, uh, uh, Ingrid, but, but you can also visit the Center for Agroforestry.org website and find resources on shiitake growing and, and other mushroom growing. And in fact, I'm giving a presentation today this afternoon at the Mid-America Organic Association near Kansas City. So if you're making it over to that conference, we have a full afternoon track on mushroom growing this afternoon. Anyway, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, any additional questions you see coming in there, Katie? Uh, hey, there uh, Grigory, can I say if you Oh, word? yeah, Bodega, welcome. Yeah, go ahead, Bodega. Yeah, I think we have the mountain uh, rose herbs here in the Northwest. They are uh, one resource for the uh, forest farming uh, kind of uh, activities. And we are organizing a workshop uh, in April uh, that will be focused on agroforestry in the Pacific Northwest. That will be a resource for this gentleman. And also he can join the Pacific Northwest Agroforestry Working Group to learn more about our activities here in the Northwest. Great, thank you, Bodega. Maybe you could type in your email in the chat box if you're able, uh, otherwise I'll, I'll make sure to put you both in touch. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Bodega, that's great. Um, Katie, I do see one question that might uh, be of interest to address, and it's from uh, uh, D. Fuller. And it's talking about the slide with showing ramps and just asking, you know, uh, for a, a quick uh, assessment on whether it's profitable to grow ramps versus harvesting wild ramps. That, of course, is going to vary uh, from location to location in markets. But you, would you have anything to comment about that, Katie? Um, it's not one that, that we've done specific uh, economic or break-even analyses on. So I can't get into the specifics like I could with black cohosh, for example. Um, but I would just concur that it really largely depends on the market. You know, if you're selling to a high-end restaurant in New York City, you're going to be getting a lot of money. Um, and, and so it just really depends on the market, I would mm. say. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think we have clarification from Michael. Uh, with, with these break-even prices, so if you see the actual chart under 2016, $78 per dry pound is the break even price. And so that is basically, Michelle kept track of everything from the amount of time it took her to, um, to steward, to uh, get her certifications in order, to harvest, to process, to market, um, and, and as well as her certification costs. Um, and so in order for her to just break even and cover her costs in 2016, she would have needed $78 per dry pound, but she only received $25 per dry pound. Mm. So in 2017, she kept track of those same costs, but was using efficient commercialized equipment at our facility um, and was able to drop her break-even price down to $44 per dry pound. Um, and we were able to bring the sales price up to 60. So she was able to make um, mm. some money. And I think Eric Burkhart used $15 per hour as the rate. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Uh, if you notice, there's one more question from Ingrid West. Uh, just asked about you know your sources of funding, uh, both generally uh, for um, your programs uh, that you're able to offer, as well as if if you've worked with more specific programs and perhaps helped uh, growers access programs like uh, Equip, uh, or have you worked with a conservation innovation grant? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, we we get our funding from all sorts of sources. We have private foundations, um, state grants like the Virginia Department of Ag and Consumer Services or Tobacco Commission. Um, we have uh, funding from federal sources as well. The Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition is funded, and we get we're a subawardee on that. It's funded through the USDA Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program (BFRDP). So it's like an alphabet soup over here with all of these grants. Uh, but we also, um, in December, we found out that we've been awarded a national NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant um, for our uh, forest farming program and to expand our alicropping work with medicinal herbs. Uh, and so the, the goal of that is going to be to work with equip eligible landowners on those two practices. Um, we'll be keeping track of all sorts of data uh, to provide recommendations for future farmers. Um, and eventually we're, we're hoping to get multi-story cropping as an approved practice with NRCS equip um, for their cost share program uh, in all central Appalachian states. So that in the future, farmers can apply for that funding to implement some of these practices on their property. Hmm. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, uh, I should uh, mention that uh, NRCS and, and often state programs, uh, conservation or Department of Natural Resources do often have uh, grant programs or cost share programs that could be uh, applicable uh, to a, a something kinds of forest farming uh, operation so it's worthwhile to to look into that and see what kind of uh, assistance or cost share might be available uh, I think we are, you already addressed Michael's follow-up question of what rate per hour and um, maybe we'll go out on one final question uh, Katie um, from uh, a participant JAA74 um, who just asked about any example of forest farming in dry forest or woodlands. And I'm going to say I'm not so familiar. I'm certainly aware of a lot of wild crafting and non-timber forest products from dry forest, but I'm not so familiar with forest farming in, in dry forest. How about yourself, Katie? Um, no, typically the forest botanicals need to have really rich, moist soil, high in organic matter um, on, a, on a bit of a slope with good drainage. So it can't be, you know, stagnant water um, but typically the drier sites like um, under oaks for example we might not see as many uh, mm -hmm. forest botanicals so I, I'm not uh, they, they do require moist soil if it's too right. dry um, then they won't be happy but if it's too wet they won't be happy either so mm -hmm. there's a balance to strike so it may be that in those areas there could be other species of economic potential or interest mm -hmm. But the, the species we've discussed today, really, uh, we're not aware of uh, them being, you know, re really viable or commercially viable in, in those kind of uh, ecological zones. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Katie uh, and, and everyone, we've come to the hour and we've had a, a great presentation and a lively discussion. I, I think uh, uh, there's no further questions or comments. I think we'll uh, conclude here. And uh, Katie, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. And if anyone has any questions, um, uh, if you have my uh, email address and my phone number, happy to follow up. Like I mentioned, we are in the middle of moving offices. So it probably won't be until next week that I'll be uh, organized enough <laughs> to respond. But. Thank you. And, and to participants, uh, if there's any other further follow-up questions, you're welcome to contact me or, or the Center for Agroforestry. And, and we'll, uh, uh, if you did not get any information from today, or want to follow up with Katie uh, uh, and don't have her email. Uh, do we have it uh, uh, posted there, Katie? If not, they can just yeah, talk to us. Yeah, let's see. Oh, there uh, it is again. Oh, there it is. Great. And, um, and just know that, as I mentioned, this webinar and all webinars in the Agroforestry in Action webinar series are recorded and are available for, for on-demand viewing on our website. That's the centerforagroforestry.org. So we thank you for participating. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.